move from the Old Testament to the New. I hope you're ready. Two-thirds of your Bible is Old Testament, and I hope that I've been modeling something about its significance and importance um, as the playing field for the New Testament, in a sense, for the drama that unfolds in redemption and creation. However, let me um, make some uh, um, attempts to get at historical realities in the New Testament. When you open up the New Testament, <laughs> you're confronted with this marvelously inspiring paragraph. Let me read the opening verses of the New Testament, which, like the Gettysburg Address, is a never-to-be-forgotten uh, paragraph. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, the good news according to Matthew. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Now, I probably didn't need to read this. You probably all have it memorized. <laughs> um, but why, you may have asked, <laughs> does the New Testament good news begin with a cemetery tour? I mean, Matthew takes us to a graveyard and in the first six verses to the oldest section of the graveyard. Three sets of 14 names of dead people. And in the first paragraph are four women, the grandmothers of Jesus. There are five women mentioned, by the way, in chapter one. The one that we tell at Christmas time is the mother of Jesus, Mary. The ones we never bring out at Christmas time are the skeletons in the closet, the other women in the family of Jesus. And they are up front in the opening paragraph called the good news. Now let me remind you of where these four women came from. Tamar was a Canaanite who married the oldest son of Judah. Genesis 38 is the background to Tamar's story. Genesis 38 is a 20-year gap in the Joseph story. Judah was the leader of the sons who made the deal to sell Joseph off to Egypt. And Joseph disappears off stage in the drama for 20 years. He re-enters re as the king of Potiphar's family and eventually the vice regent of, of Egypt. So the historian does a flashback and tells you, now let's talk about what happened to Judah, the brother who sold Joseph. He had three sons. The oldest one, Ur, married Tamar and died. So the Leverett marriage law being what it was, the second son was obligated to marry Tamar to preserve the property. Onan didn't want to conceive of this marriage. He, he, the text is very explicit there. He, he refused to consummate that marriage sexually, and therefore he died. About this time, Judah decided that his daughter-in-law was a witch or something, having devoured two of his three sons. As the father of three sons, I, I well understand his thinking. He decided to send her back home to be a perpetual widow. Uh, how long she disappeared, I don't know. But then finally the sheep shearing season comes some years later, and she takes some initiative. Tamar decides to dress as a prostitute and go down there beside the road, knowing her father-in-law is going to pass. And she makes a pass, and he uh, gets involved in an affair, a sort of pre-Jimmy Baker sort of <laughs> event. And <laughs> some months later, the word comes to Judah, hey, Judah, here's a bit of news you may be interested in. Your, your former widowed, twice widowed uh, daughter-in-law is pregnant. And he was furious, chauvinist that he was. He said, bring her to me. He was very angry. And he said, who's the father? And she said, well, I'm not quite sure, but whoever it was left this credit card. Um, 
<laughs> that was the signature ring, you know, because when Judah had this little enclave with her, he said, I don't have money to pay you, but here's my credit card, um, my signature ring. That's the credit card in the Middle East. And so, gee, she shows up with the credit card, and Judah is just devastated. Mm -hmm. And Tamar produces twins from her own father-in-law, which become one of them, a grandfather of David, great-grandfather of Jesus. Now, the second woman in the text, in the first verse, is um, uh, the matron of a hotel in Jericho. <laughs> we know what kind of a hotel it is. The clue is in Hebrews 11 and James chapter 2, where she is called a porne woman. Porne? It's the root of the Greek word for pornography. I'll give you some idea of this hotel that she ran. Um, <laughs> It's also, you know, the lights are low in those kind of hotels and nobody asks you your name. And so that's where the spies went to hide when they were infiltrating Jericho and the Gestapo knocked at the door and said, where are those foreigners? We saw them come in here. She lied and said, they went that away. She sent the, you know, the sort of CIA on a false trail. And then she called out these two spies and said, I've heard about your God and the Exodus and deliverance from Egypt, I want to believe. Now, it's very obvious that her faith had to save her. Her works would never have done it, <laughs> right? And she, the second woman in this opening paragraph, um, she becomes a mother. She marries into the family tree of Israel and becomes a grandmother of Ruth and a grandmother uh, through marriage to another Boaz, not the same Boaz of the uh, but a different one, and she becomes then uh, the second woman in this text, Rahab. Now the third one is Ruth. I've already told you the story of Ruth, the Moabite. The fourth one is Mrs. Uriah. Now, Mrs. Uriah was the father of David's number one soldier, Uriah the Hittite. Now the biblical background to this story is 2 Samuel 11, where it was the war season, and David was clearly in midlife crisis. As nearly as we can tell, he was about 47. Middle management had gone off to war, but being CEO, he was home, and he was really bored. And life for him was like Pepsi without fizz, it, sort of flat. He was up on the roof, and he saw this woman, and he got involved, sort of another Jimmy Baker or somebody kind of an affair. And then you have what we could call the Jerusalem Gate cover-up scheme in three stages. Stage one, he invited Uriah to come home for a little R&R, &R, hoping he'd go home and it would look like the kid was his. Plan one failed. Uriah was too good a soldier to go home with all the other men on the front. So David, plan two, took him to the palace and got him good and drunk, hoping he would go home. He didn't go home. Plan three, is so dastardly you can hardly believe it of David. Uh, he, he wrote a letter um, of execution, which was that you fight all the way up to the wall and then quickly retreat. Now, in the ancient world, you don't fight up to the wall because all they have to do is drop a rock on your head and you're dead, you know? And it would look like an accident. And of course, that's what happened. And David then, hearing the news, plan three succeeded was able to marry the grieving widow, and the whole nation rejoiced in the midst of their uh, sadness that David has, the man on the dashing white horse had solved it. But it was a cover-up scheme. There was some mole or somebody who got the word, and the prophet got the word directly from God or through somebody else. Anyway, he exposed the whole plot, and the Davidic presidency came crumbling down like Watergate, so, hence Jerusalem Gate. Now. It's like four tombstones here, you know? Rahab, Tamar, Ruth, and Mrs. Uriah, who maybe because of deference to the king, her name is not mentioned, but we know who she is. Now, Jerome was the first one to do a sermon on this passage. He, Jerome, in the fourth century, looked at these four women and said, my goodness, they're all sinners. Right, Jerome. He said, I think that the point 
of their inclusion in Matthew 1 is to show the purpose of the grace of God in the heart of the gospel, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners like these women. I think Jerome was right. Luther looked at this same text, and Luther saw something that no one had ever seen before. And Luther said, all four women are foreigners. They are not only sinners, but you have two Canaanites, a Moabite and a Hittite. Luther said, it's not only that Jesus came to save sinners, but foreign sinners. This is about missions. Stephen Neal picks up on that and says, chapter 28 says, go into all the world and disciple all the nations, right? Chapter 1 tells you who all the nations are. Canaanites, Moabites, Hittites, and Jews. So you have an international bracket around Matthew's gospel. Obviously, there's more. Raymond Brown, writing on this, says, I think, I think Jerome is right, Luther is right. I see something more. I think as Matthew studied the Bible, he, he, he picked out every single scandalous marriage and birth story in the Old Testament, and he brought it all in one place as a gift to Mary to be a kind of historical support group for Mary, who was having trouble explaining where her kid came from. <laughs> to show Mary that she was not alone in giving birth in the family history of Israel, that there were people in her closet that would be skeletons to most, but that she ought to ponder them in her heart. I think Raymond Brown is right on. I think that's probably partly behind Matthew's uh, purpose, is to give Mary a gift. Um, I see something else, of course, from my con context. I see Jesus picking up on Luther and the sin of Jerome and the need of the women to be supported, especially the public aid women in my church. Most of the women in my church were mixed racial. Most of my kids were. Almost all of us are, right? Jesus, on his human side, picked up every scandalous bloodline in the Middle East, okay? Matthew clearly teaches the virgin birth of Jesus. No doubt about that. Parthenos is virgin. Matthew clearly teaches. It's all I need to believe it. And you must believe the virgin birth to be a Christian, in my view, because the virgin birth reminds us that the human race didn't reach up to God, as in every other religion, but God reached down. The virgin birth pr proves that the human race could not produce its own savior. The, human, the virgin birth is the counterpart to the ascension at the end of Jesus' life. Miraculous entry, miraculous exit. So the, Jesus' life is bracketed in deity at that level. But the very same Matthew that teaches the virgin birth and the sinlessness of the virgin birth and the non-contaminated deity also says that when God became flesh, he really did it in technicolor, folks. I mean the scandalous bloodlines of Genesis 19, all those R-rated chapters of the Old Testament, Okay, Tamar, that incestuous hit on the side of the road that produced, and, and that hotel matron in Jericho, and that Moabite girl from the incestuous Moab, and these Hittites who were the sort of Cuban mercenaries of the ancient world that Jesus deliberately choreographed into his own body the bloodlines of all of the outgroups of the Middle East. Canaanites of the cursed race of Canaan in Genesis 9. Two of the mothers, grandmothers of Jesus were Canaanites. Imagine that. Cursed be Canaan. And two Canaanites end up in the family of Jesus. Moabite and Hittite. I have a black kid. And uh, I am preaching all the time to mixed racial people. And this, to me, is the good news of Matthew, is that on his human side, the international gospel is that Jesus, in his own body, incorporated the racial diversities that nobody else wanted. This list of names smashes racism. And 
the idea of Jewish superiority. Now, why would Matthew do this? Why would he tell this story? Luke doesn't say it. Nobody else does. Mark doesn't even mention the birth of Jesus. That's an interesting question. <laughs> let, me, let me shock you, maybe. The early church didn't give a rip about the birth of Jesus. They never mentioned it. Nobody in the book of Acts ever stood up to preach and said, now, folks, let me tell you about Christmas. Let me tell you about the birth of Jesus and the wise men, the shepherds, and all that good stuff. And if you don't believe me, go down there to Bethlehem six miles south and check it all out. Nobody in the book of Acts, there's not one sermon in the early church on the birth of Jesus. I have yet to find one in any of the early fathers. Do you know that? Not until much later. No, you know, the early church preaching was all about the heavenly Jesus, the Jesus who had ascended, the Jesus who was Lord, the Jesus who was, had conquered death, right? But then Gnosticism came along, and Gnosticism embraced the Jesus of the heavens, the Colossian Jesus. Gnosticism was very comfortable with a Jesus in the heavens, a powerful Jesus in the sky. And here's my thesis, and not mine alone. It's, I think, the thesis of most New Testament scholars. Under the pressure of Gnosticism, the early church said, uh-oh, we've been missing something in our theology. We need to reach back and connect the history. We need to, to say some things to this generation, or Gnosticism is going to carry our people away. We've got to rediscover. I mean, nobody in the first century had any problem with the deity of Christ. They assumed it. The problem was the humanity of Jesus, the humanity of Christ. And so the early church, I happen to believe that the, the infancy narratives of Matthew and Luke are the last parts of Matthew and Luke to have been written. They are like the overture to an opera or a symphony, an overture to an operetta. You know what the function of an overture is. It's to introduce all the motifs that are going to come up. Do you, would you suppose the overture is the first or the last part of the opera to be written? You, does the composer sit down and write an overture and then write the opera? No. Oh. And I don't think Matthew and Luke did either. I think, I think they wrote the story of Jesus they wrote it very differently for reasons rooted in their own personalities, their own contexts. Um, Matthew was a first-generation disciple. Luke was a second-generation disciple. Uh, they wrote them for very different reasons, but partly as a counter to Gnosticism, they reached back and they connected the heavenly Jesus with the earthly tradition. And so it became very important for Matthew the theologian and Luke the theologian to retell the Jesus story in a way that nobody in the book of Acts ever told it. And so you know what Matthew does? He tells us about a Jesus who's a part of a political coup, uh, who has to flee to another country and go to Egypt. And Matthew tells the story of the exile in Egypt to connect it with the exile of the people of God in the Old Testament. And four times in Matthew 1 and 2, in the Joseph story, there are dreams, four times. Now, who was the great dreamer of the Old Testament? Joseph. And where was he? In Egypt. Matthew's an artist. He didn't invent this, folks. That's what makes me a conservative. Liberals might think he just invented it. I don't think so. I think Joseph did have dreams. I think, I think there were dreams. I honestly believe that. And Hebrews says God used dreams to inform people. I don't believe that um, this is a problem. Um, even Young believes in dreams, um, so I believe in dreams. Um, well, uh, Matthew retells the story of Jesus and has Jesus recapitulating the trip to Egypt. Out of Egypt I've called my son. The Jesus of Matthew goes through Jordan after 40, he has 40 days in the desert one for each year Israel's in the desert. What is Matthew the theologian doing? He's, he's connecting Jesus the Savior to the history of Israel. And the genealogy does that, you see. 
And so Matthew has connected Jesus to the previous history and recovered for us the incarnation and its significance and power. So the history in, this, in the New Testament is extremely important. This is good news, folks. It's worthy of memorization, even though it is a cemetery tour. It's the theology of Matthew to take us on a cemetery tour because the rootedness of Jesus, the sinless Christ in a mixed racial environment is good news in a world, in my neighborhood, where 60 nations are in the high school where my kids went. 60 nations go to the high school in my neighborhood. This will preach. The tombstones speak to my neighborhood, okay? The grandmothers of Jesus are important. A few years ago, I was in Egypt for the All Africa Conference of Churches, and I, I remember Sadat, the late president, came to the meeting. He uh, it was wonderful. He had this opening speech, which Mubarak read. Um, and um, Sadat said, the Christ child fled to Egypt and lived here in Cairo. And I blinked. Hey, of course that's true. It's in the Bible. The Christ child fled to Egypt and lived here in Cairo to escape the scourge of Zionism in Palestine. <laughs> <laughs> Contextualization, okay? <laughs> Sadat was interpreting Herod as the illegitimate puppet who had been installed on the throne by those evil Romans in the West, right? And that's the way the Palestinians look at us as the pro-Zionist installers of this regime in, that took away their land in the Middle East. That really did give me an interesting uh, jar. Sadat, I think, is, was right on. Um, the history is important. By the way, two-thirds of the children of the world are Asian. Half of the newborns of the world are yellow. Two-thirds of the children of the world are Asian. Half of the refugees of the world are Africans. Jesus got in touch with both realities. Asian-born baby, African refugee. Flight to Egypt. By George, that ought to be part of your Christmas story. It'll play in the city. Okay? That's not how the middle class tells the Christmas story, about all those babies killed in Bethlehem, uh, political revolution, uh, migration to a foreign continent. It's the Christmas story, the gospel, right? Hey, Matthew is doing something for us. This is real gospel. I mean, this is, this is, this is reality that the early preaching in Acts had missed. They were so caught up with the, with the heavenly Christ legitimately because the bonds of death and cemeteries had been broken, they were celebrating the heavenliness of Jesus and they had lost sight of the earthliness. Matthew and Luke bring us back down to the earthliness. Again, it's that tension that I think we need to put together in theology. Do you see how history functions? See why it becomes important that in our discipleship we connect people to history. The, um, Matthew is interestingly written, you know, it's, it's in five sections. There's an action section, then a teaching section, an action section, teaching section, action. What do you suppose Matthew's trying to do? Feed on theory. Okay, how so? Right. Okay, action and then reflection, yeah. He's doing something else. What, what about the Hebrew Torah? First five books of the Pentateuch. Right? The books of Moses. Moses went up on the mount to get the law. Right? Where is the first sermon of Jesus in Matthew? It's up on a mount too, right? And if you read Matthew 5 to 7 in the light of, as W.D. Davies, a rabbi who has written on this, says, you will understand that what Matthew was doing is recapitulating the new law of Christ on top of the old law of Moses. You have heard it said of old, da 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 da, but I say unto you, da 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 da. And so you have the five sections of the life of Christ 
which is sort of a new law for Christians. A dispensationalist missed this totally because they just take the whole book and throw it into a future uh, kingdom understanding. I think they miss, really. I mean, let's face it, we're all dispensationalists unless we're offering sheep today. <laughs> but there is a sort of dispensationalism which just violates, I think, the whole genius of Matthew's understanding of, of the writer, uh, the writing and the history here and its purpose and how we ought to read it. So there's a great deal of history here. Let me jump also into um, something that I have um, reflected on from Paul. You know that, at least I've said, and I think you probably know that Paul was a missionary and that you, you need to read Paul's letters and remember that they're half of a telephone conversation. You ever listen to somebody talk on the phone? And from the answers, you deduct what the questions are? That's really what's going on in Paul. He's planted a struggling church over there or over there, and they're asking questions, and Paul is writing to respond to them. Paul did a wonderful thing as a church planner. He never stayed too long to dominate the work. <laughs> he sort of got it going and then left town, trusting the Spirit. Instead of hanging around for 20 years to smother it, to make sure it was formed in his image, church planters need to learn that. So do missionaries. They stay on the station and, and they plant the gospel, but then they stay there and run it, and that's the kiss of death. Paul was too smart for that. He'd plant it, trust the Spirit, run away, and then write letters back. Very interesting. <coughs> Early church sort of got into trading letters back and forth. They had two letters of Colossians or one of Philippians and three draft choices and things like that. <laughs> anyway, they would uh, trade these letters and it's interesting to read the earliest letters. Romans 13, Paul has a very optimistic view of government, right? Submit, written probably just before Nero took charge of Paul, rolled his head off by Appia. Peter is neutral about government. What is the Roman government when, by the time you get to Revelation 13, 30 years later, what is the view of government? Babylon. It's Babylon. It's the enemy. And not only do you not obey it, you treat it as the devil itself. Same government in the 60s had gone to seed in the 90s. Now, a lot of evangelicals run out and quote Revelation, Romans 13 all the time and say, be subject to the government in everything. And they, they misunderstand, I think, the whole New Testament principle. Oscar Kuhlman describes in his book, Church and State in the New Testament, which is the early church lived dynamically under the Roman government for three decades, yes. And the early church understood the legitimacy of the Roman government, except like I accept the legitimacy of um, Chicago City Council. And I live under its authority. But by George, I can imagine sometime when I will fight for the overthrow of my city council as a Christian, because the council has a tendency to go off God's path. It's been known to do that occasionally. And I can imagine fighting the government of Illinois and even the government of the United States. I can imagine that. I'm not inclined to do so. I'm a pacifist of sorts. I really don't like blood. Uh, and I'm not a violent person. Um, and I'm more inclined to be a martyr, I suppose, than a soldier. Uh, but I can imagine that the New Testament principle is government is legitimate as long as it is a legitimate government. But when it ceases to be, a legitimate government, it must be opposed. Indeed, uh, it becomes a Babylon. It's no longer Rome. It's a Babylon. And you not only shouldn't obey it, you should see it as demonic and fight it, overthrow it. You see, the whole idea then of interpreting the New Testament missiologically gives us permission to approach Christians in South Africa or even ask the question, in 1776, would you have participated in the armed overthrow of the British government over the tariff on tobacco 
I mean, that was really an important issue for us evangelicals back in 1770s, <laughs> right? Over that, we will shed blood. Imagine us now turning around and telling the South African black who has no political rep representation or the Palestinians whose land has been taken that they shouldn't fight to overthrow the government. We certainly did. Well, we were practicing the Romans 13 to Revelation 13 paradigm. That is, we assumed the British government was legitimate up to the point, up to a certain point, and then we literally armed intervention. We overthrew it and declared our independence from it. Now, I don't think we're being very helpful in a world of emerging nations today if we can't give them that principle and show them how that principle has worked historically, even in the early church and in our own American Revolution. So again, the New Testament is a working document. It's a living document. The, it's a missiological document. It's, uh, Paul is doing so many creative things. For example, the early Paul in 1 Corinthians says, you know, I think widows probably should remain perpetual widows. Uh, ten years later, in the pastorals, Paul says, you know, I think widows should probably remarry. Now, what do you do with texts like that? Get nervous? Try to explain them away? Uh, or do you say, in 10 years, Paul had learned some things about widows in the church in the context of the Roman Empire, that uh, widowhood was not something advantageous after all, and that maybe the Lord wasn't going to come back as soon as Paul thought, and therefore he had to change his strategy. I'm not, uh, I'm not surprised at that because, in fact, I'm very encouraged about it because I don't claim that Paul was inerrant. I claim the scripture is inerrant. And by inerrant, I mean that the Bible always teaches what is true even when it reports what is false. That's the definition I memorized at Trinity. It says the Bible, rightly interpreted in its linguistic, historical, and cultural context, always teaches what is true. Now, it reports Satan's false philosophy. Satan's lies are documented, right? Job's false friend's false theory, their bad advice is documented accurately. Stephen stood up and made an error in his preaching in Acts 7. You mentioned the number of group people that went down to Egypt contradicts the Old Testament in Genesis. Luke, who clearly would have understood that, did not change the mistake. He recorded accurately Stephen's mistake. He reported the falsehood, but that's not what he is teaching. I think if we understand uh, the New Testament, we will have uh, documentation to help people in discipleship today. Look at the early church. The early church was mostly Jewish. And Paul went on a journey, and a whole bunch of Gentile converts. Now the early church has a problem. The Jews had sort of hoped that all the people would become culturally Jewish in order to become Christians. Sort of like go through the gate of the synagogue to get to the door of the church. They really had set the whole thing up that way. Paul went out to do that, got blown out of the synagogue, and went out and rented theaters and preached to people like he did in Ephesus and did a whole end run around Judaism. So there was a council in Acts 15 where they had to sort out the issue, what is the faith and what is not the faith, the culture. Acts 15 is an inventory on the gospel versus culture. And the early church there said Martin Luther in his, on the councils and churches, which he wrote in 1539, toward the end of his life, one of the most insightful commentaries on Acts 15 is Luther's reflection in that essay. Luther said, the first task of the church was to decide what the gospel was. And then, having decided what it was, what it wasn't. And it certainly wasn't anything about eating blood, meat offered to idols, and that had nothing to do with the gospel. So Luther said those are what the early church would call, or what Luther would call, love issues, not faith issues. So Luther said the early church was forced 
because it was becoming cross-cultural to sort out what is a love issue. Is hair length? Is that a faith issue? Uh-uh. It's a love issue. If it's a love issue, a cultural issue, it means it's so unimportant to the gospel that it shouldn't matter to us. If somebody says, I think you should have longer hair, fine. No big deal. Because it has nothing to do with the gospel. So what the early church was learning was to sort out faith questions from gospel questions. Faith question from culture because the early church had to go cross-cultural. Then you know what Luther says? That's what the church should be doing all the time. We need to do cultural inventory. How much of your navigator evangelism strategy is a subculture of the middle class? Mostly the individual way you deal with people in evangelism. Have you ever reflected on John 4 when Jesus met the woman at the well? Contrast John 3 and John 4, by the way. John 3 is middle of the night. John 4, middle of the day. John 3 is indoors. John 4 is outdoors. John 3, high-born kosher Jew. John 4, outcast, social outcast. John 3, Jesus teases the Nicodemus with images of air, external. Uh, John 4, images of water, internal. I mean, the, it's very interesting, very artistic, sort of the whole human gamut of persons. Jesus didn't have just one four-law track to give to both people. That's not fair, probably not even kind, but I had to say it. I mean, Jesus just didn't have one method for all these people. Uh, about the time the woman, by the way, Nicodemus' conversion is, um, John not only writes what the gospel is, but John also models all the different ways people come to Christ in the gospel. For example, Nicodemus, who comes to Jesus at night in John 3, cautiously defends Jesus in John 7 at the illegal meeting of the Sanhedrin, finally becomes a Christian when he sees the cross. The cross pushed him over the line, and he went and, along with his friend, secured the body of Jesus and buried it. That's his conversion. He was willing to identify with the death of Jesus. That didn't convert. Thomas. Thomas wasn't converted in John's gospel till he saw the living Jesus, the resurrection. The resurrection was the gospel message for Thomas. The death atonement was for Nicodemus. The man in John 9 became a believer when he was um, healed of blindness, physical, and he became an evangelist. The woman in John 4 is an interesting one because um, just when she's ready to become a believer, Jesus wouldn't let her. He said, go call your husband. Don't have one. Jesus said, you're right. You've had five. You're living common law now. In that, Jesus understood Samaritan culture. Women don't make, in Samaritan culture, eternal decisions without their significant other relationships. You don't do evangelism cross-culturally in ethnic communities without the support system of the family. Jesus backed off leading her to an understanding of himself to include her network. She was the Norma Ray of the village. Have you seen the movie? She was the gatekeeper that unlocked a whole culture, and Jesus knew it. By the way, in verse 42, verse 39 to 42 of John 4, which I hadn't seen for years. And I'd studied with Paul Little, Evangelism and Seminary. And he mentions this in How to Give Away Your Faith. He mentions, he has a whole chapter on John 4, and he doesn't mention what I'm going to mention to you. I hadn't seen it either. After she came to Christ and she brought the whole village to Jesus, then we have this little phrase. And he, Jesus, <clears throat> stayed with them for two days. Hey, he moved in and stayed with the woman and her pathological network for two days. If you're going to do ethnic evangelism, don't do the hit and run stuff, okay? You move in and you stay with them in their pathology. That's Jesus' example. So here's cross-cultural evangelism in John's Gospel. Just 
the whole New Testament is shot through with this stuff, and I, again, had not seen it. It wasn't my own personal experience here. It was in the Bible, and some of it wasn't even part of my church's experience. But when I was down here, again, my quadrilateral, when I started reading the Bible in my context, I saw, yeah, the nickel dropped and the light went on on some of these texts. Let me uh, do something I call the drama of New Testament evangelism, which is another history in the New Testament. This is the story of Philemon, which I'm going to call the drama of New Testament evangelism. And because it's a drama, I'm going to put it into five-act drama. Act one, city of Ephesus, about the year 51, text Acts 19, 8 to 10. Paul moves into the city, goes to the synagogue because he wants to reach Jews. Gets thrown out of the synagogue after three months, rents the Greek theater, the sort of amphitheater of Tyrannus, because he wants to reach not Jews, but he wants to reach Greeks. Because Paul knows that you don't get Greeks in synagogues. Greeks go to theaters. They go to the Stoa, they go to the market, they go to the uh, Areopagus. So you go there. Paul is already then in the largest city of Asia, beginning his mission, and he designs the ministry in the shape of the people he's trying to reach. When Paul worked with Jews, we know he used the rabbinic method. He argued with him about the kingdom of God from morning till evening. When Paul wanted to reach Greeks, Luke uses this word, he dialoguminos, from which we get dialogue, Socratic method. Questions and answers. You see, we can already begin to see about evangelism that Paul was using methods he was multicultural. He wanted to reach different audiences. He didn't have a canned method for everybody. Philemon was converted sometime in the two years Paul spent here. By the way, Acts verse 8, 19, verse 10 says, and the gospel spread all over Asia. Paul didn't go all over Asia. This is Ephesus on the Mediterranean. This is Luke in hyperbole. Paul didn't go all over Asia. The gospel traveled all over Asia. Paul penetrated synagogues and theaters. The very nature of the city, with its harbors and its river running through it and so on, its regional, is that the city is a woofer and a tweeter of an amplifier system, okay? You penetrate the city, the gospel will travel. Philemon lived in the Lycus Valley up here, Laodicea and Colossae, twin cities. 100 miles away, like Milwaukee to Chicago, he would come down and buy supplies occasionally, maybe for the opening of the opera or the theater season, I don't know. In the midst of that, he finds Christ. He goes back, and Act Two carries us to the book of Philemon. Philemon, converted to Christ probably in this theater, goes back to Laodicea, Colossae, Philemon, verse 2. And we suddenly end up with a house church, with a church in your house. In that house church is a, is a slave named Onesimus who steals money, <laughs> runs away to Rome to get lost in the crowd. Act three in the drama is Paul goes to Rome. Acts 28, 23 to 30. And Paul rents a house in South Rome. Now here's Rome, Latin Rome and Greek Rome. Paul had six associates, near as we can tell, Tychicus, Epaphras, Aristarchus, Lucas, Demas, and Marcus. They all have Greek names. Basically pretty convinced that Paul settled into ethnic Rome. 
Rome was the only city outside sea on China that had a million people in the ancient world. And Paul had a kind of Leighton Ford reach out style. He was under house arrest. He was in the house, which he rented, verse 23, verse 30, for two years at his own expense. <clears throat> his associates would go out in the street, reach people, bring them back to Paul, and he would evangelize and disciple. One of the people reached in Rome is Onesimus. Probably around the year, if this is uh, the year 53, the planting of the house church, this happened, this would be the year roughly 63. About 12 years after the Ephesus crusade begins, Paul is in Rome. 12 years after leading a slave owner to Christ, Paul leads the slave to Christ, disciples him, and then writes this wonderful 330 word in the Greek text letter, which is the only private letter in the New Testament, and it's hand carried. It's written on a single sheet. If I borrow a single eight and a half by 11 sheet from me. Right, it would all fit on this sheet. And after writing it, Paul, Paul sealed it up. By the way, it's a wonderful letter. The first three verses are a sort of uh, benediction. Paul begins benedictions at the beginning. He says, Paul, a slave. Paul, a prisoner, rather. Paul, a prisoner. He doesn't say Paul, apostle. Paul, a prisoner. He's sort of evoking pity a little bit, I think. Verses 4 to 7, he butters up uh, Philemon. Philemon, you have no idea how much joy I get here in my imprisonment thinking about all the good stuff you're doing for Jesus. Why your prayer life and everything about you is just, just marvelous, you know. Just, it's such an encouragement to those of us who are suffering for Jesus here in Rome. Keep it up, my good brother. Verse 8, I mean, Paul has just been putting in the knife. Now he starts to twist it slowly. He says, now it's about Onesimus, my brother, my son, my son in the faith, my very heart. Uh, I'd like to keep him, but for your sake, I'd like him to come home. Now, I want you to treat him well. Treat him as though he were me. Um, by the way, if he owes you anything, charge it to my account. My Visa card number is, and it raises the question, does Paul have a line of credit in Asia? You betcha. The next phrase says, by the way, I remind you, you owe your very life to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, not very subtle, Paul, right? I mean, Paul the psychologist, this is a Paul that's not in any other letter. This is a Paul sitting in a sort of confinement writing this. This is all on behalf of a runaway slave. Now, then he says, by the way, perhaps this is why he ran away from you for a little while, so you could have him back forever. Paul is doing a theological reflection on a first century international migration. A guy steals money in Asia, runs to Rome, gets lost in the crowd, gets saved in Rome, goes back to Asia, and Paul sees it as part of the divine plan for redemption. My God, what a wonderful possibility for looking at people coming over the Rio Grande borders into this country. Isn't that wonderful? The whole world's coming to the United States. We're becoming a third world nation, and they're all in my neighborhood. Praise God. That's not how most Americans see it. <laughs> I see it that way. I mean. You know, Jesus said, go to the ends of the earth, preach the gospel to all the nations. Now they're in the neighborhood. It's wonderful. It's a lot cheaper. It's, <laughs> besides, we're not crowded in this country. If you put every single 240 million Americans in the state of California, and we all live there together, we'd still be less crowded than Japan. Okay. Then, Jesus, then Paul says, by the way, fix up the guest room. I hope to come and see how things are working out. Love, Paul. Now he rolls this up, puts a signature ring, and Tychicus and Onesimus carry this letter a thousand miles back home and knock on the door. You know, five minutes. I get really dramatic. I said it was a drama. The third act, they carry this letter across Asia, preaching all the way probably, taking offerings, going home, reading the, Maybe they read the letter. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, when they, when they got there, <laughs> When they got there, uh, the door opens, Philemon gets this letter. Now, Philemon has a problem. Roman law says slaves are to be branded if they steal money. 
the Latin letter F on the forehead for fugitiva. Hot branding iron. It's hard to believe that that's what Paul expects to happen here. The second option is a slave who stole money and ran away is to be executed. Um, in this model, um, Philemon would call all the slaves together on the old Bar H ranch that he ran there. And he would say, uh, I want you all to know that fellow slave Onesimus has returned. He's gone to Rome and he's become a believer. Would you share your testimony? And then after it's done, you stick a knife in him and bury him and you keep the law. Well, it's hard to believe that's what he expects to come. The third option, and, and by the way, the second option was rooted in Aristotle's politics, uh, which has a section on slaves, which says slaves are not people. Slaves are property. And they should be executed. They're not to be personal in any way. The third um, possible Roman uh, option was to go down to the courthouse and buy manumission papers, which were slave documents, and pay for the freedom of the slave. Now let me ask you, which option do you think Paul is encouraging him to do? I think you got it. He expects him to read the letter and say, oh my God, the slave's going to cost me twice. <laughs> Once because he stole my money, now I've got to go buy his freedom. But Paul did not also say, this is kind of a for Pete, any Pete Wagner's in the audience. You know Pete, homogeneous unit, Pete? One of the things Paul did not say here was, I want you to start a church for former slaves on a back alley someplace. He didn't say that. I get the impression that this slave is going to be welcomed into the house church. And Paul, if you read the lines, is saying, I led you to Christ back in Ephesus, and now I've led your slave to Christ and I'm the father. What does that make them? Brothers. This is the emancipation document of the New Testament. Slaves become brothers. The cost of grace and discipleship. It is not enough to preach at slaves. You've got to set them free. That's in this document. Now, one thing we know happened. Uh, Philemon didn't rip up the letter throw it away, otherwise it wouldn't be in the New Testament. So he must have accepted it, and we end up here with a brand new institution in the history of the world. Nobody had ever seen an integrated house church, an integrated church, where slaves and free. It had been pronounced by Paul as God's will in Galatians 3. There's no distinction between slaves, between women. Got to talk about women in leadership here. No distinction between slaves or women or race. Race, sex, or social caste are banished in the church. It took a, you know, it's easier to say that than to actually accomplish it, but here's where it was actually accomplished. Now, at this point, Paul dies around the year 67. So, we're back now in Ephesus, or in Laodicea and Colossae. By the way, this is, I should call it the reach out, urban reach out program, which, and, and in Act 4, we have a house church that is integrated. This is the end of the New Testament, but I said there are five acts. Well, it so happens that there is a fifth act. Back in Ephesus, the year is 110, and the writer is Ignatius. And Ignatius of Antioch is pastor of, this is the uh, Early Christian Fathers, volume one of Library of Christian Classics. And I'm not going to read this now, but uh, we have the Ignatian letter. Let me tell you what happened. Ignatius was pastor of the great missionary church of Antioch in the year 110. He was arrested by Romans who were going to make a, a martyr of him, and they were marching him off to Rome. And everywhere he went, 
he was guarded. And every night he wrote letters for the Christians in that community. When he got to Smyrna, Ignatius wrote a pastoral letter to the church at Ephesus. And in that letter, he acknowledges the chief pastor, the bishop of Ephesus. And guess what his name is? Onesimus. Now, there's been a lot of scholarship on this question. Is this the same Onesimus? And the answer of Protestant and Catholic scholars like A.T. Robertson, the Southern Baptist, the greatest Greek scholar we've had in this country probably, and Fitzmaier, the current Catholic biblical scholar, editor of the Jerome Biblical Commentary and so on, is unanimously, yes, it's the same for about a dozen reasons, which I won't go into, except the one. The writer uses the same pun. He calls him the profitable bishop. Prophet is the name Onesimus. Onesimus had ceased to be profitable to Philemon. And when Paul called him your profitable, he was really jarring his cage because he wasn't very profitable. He'd stolen money and ran away. Paul, Ignatius writes to the bishop of the largest city in Asia. Now, who is the bishop? The bishop is a former slave. Not only, it's, it's not just any city, folks. Do you know who the pastor was until 96 AD? John, who was, ban he was chief pastor of Ephesus until he was banished to, Cy to uh, Patmos. Now let us suppose you're on the pastor seeking or search committee to replace the last living apostle. <laughs> <laughs> the beloved John. My God, you could put all the candidates in a phone booth. I mean, other than Billy Graham and the Archangel Michael, who, who could possibly <laughs> replace the last living apostle? Imagine when the curtain opens in the year 110, we discover that 14 years after the beloved disciple, we don't know when he began, but the chief pastor of the chief city of all of Asia is a former slave, a refugee, intercontinental migrant. Now, this drama takes 61 years, and it's like a motif that runs through the whole New Testament. By the way, how did this little letter get in the New Testament? That's an interesting question. A.M. Greenslade, a British scholar, has worked on this issue. One thing we know, and that is that the early church passed around all Paul's letters and made copies of them, good and bad, and they circulated them and traded them and, and so on. But we do know that Paul's letters were first collected in one place early in the second century and in or around the city of Ephesus. Let me ask you the obvious question. Who is the primary figure in creating the New Testament canon? A former slave. It's a perfect solution for how the New Testament came into being. Because having been in Europe with Rome, in Rome with Paul, he knew all of Paul's associates. And now as the chief pastor of Ephesus, when Philemon died, who do you suppose ended up with that letter? I think, I have fun thinking this. I dream in Technicolor. That when, when this former slave, who's now the Bishop of Ephesus, is putting together the New Testament, he slips this little personal copy of Philemon into the New Testament as the cover letter and a personal testimony of a slave who'd become a bishop, an intercontinental migrant, discipled in Rome, incubated in the house church, and now the leading bishop of the leading city of Asia. If that isn't a drama, I don't know what is. It just pulsates with the significance of evangelism, the intercontinental realities of evangelism, the, the way cities function, the gospel bounces from Europe to Asia and back and forth. The social witness, 
it is not enough just to preach to your own kind of people. It's not enough just to preach. You've got to set people free. You've got to pay the costs of discipleship. And you've got to allow the poor people, the street people, to become your pastor. Right? It's all there, isn't it? It's all there in the drama. Would that our churches were as good as our gospel or our New Testament. This is the second shortest book in the New Testament. Only 2 John is shorter. I think it has the biggest message in the New Testament. Um, it is a hermeneutical window that allows me to look at international migration today. I look at Chinatown, New York, I see every single province of mainland China lives in Chinatown, New York. And I say, my Lord, if an effective Chinatown ministry in this country were to happen, look at the impact a generation or two later back on mainland China. Think of the fact that there are now 34 mosques in Chicago. That's awesome. Most of them exist where the church used to be before it fled to Wheaton or Deerfield <laughs> or other places. That's, you know, I'm being truthful. And Muslims are doing evangelism that we're unwilling to do. And that's scary. But you see the history. The New Testament isn't just a fixed static. And I'm afraid navigators, like many people, do Bible study verse by verse. You're walking among the brambles of the New Testament, among the trees. So, you know, you're down in the valley, verse by verse, and you really need to see the, the big picture. And this is what I'm calling the big picture. These, this, this is a historical look at the New Testament that not only looks at the living canon, but what has happened afterward and says, I can celebrate that. I see we've come full circle. We start in Ephesus with no church, and we come back to Ephesus, and we've got a slave running the church. That's the gospel. That gives me hope, you see, that when I'm working with public aid people on the street, I know there's some future. This is my, uh, my hope. Paul died before Act 4, certainly before Act 5. He, but you and I live on this side of Act 5. We see how it comes out. We should have hope because we see the, the way the history works. I just have to tell you, these are the kinds of things that, uh, that keep me inspired and uh, interested in New Testament and seeing it historically. Let me, in the next, any questions about that? Any reflections, problems? We have about 20 minutes as I see it. Till noon, right? Then you take your welcome break. I'm going to move away, I think, from the New Testament. I just, I mentioned Ephesians 4, the building up of the body, which has happened every generation. And I mentioned, of course, the two Christologies of Colossians and Philippians, one the transcendent Christ, one the local. The New Testament is just full of resources for dealing with world mission reality today, urban mission. History is one of the ways it gives us a framework for looking at the New Testament. I don't know how you feel, but the New Testament comes alive for me uh, when I start looking at this kind of drama. The little pieces of evangelism, I mean windows. I have a whole new way of looking at my neighborhood, which is full of refugees. My neighborhood is full of refugees. They get off the plane at O'Hare on Friday. They go to school. My, my two, two of my three sons <coughs> ran against each other for homecoming king in their high school. Sixty nations in that school out of 223 nations in the world. When Woody beat his black brother, who was the quarterback and the athletic hero, and Woody was just a wide receiver and sort of a so-so athlete, I asked Woody how he, how he won. Oh, he said, Dad, I got the Arab, black, and Chinese vote. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Woody graduated from high school, along with Brian, probably two to four years behind national norms in math and science and English. He couldn't have got into Wheaton College. He got into another college, got his degree. They've all, all my kids have been in ministry. They all went to bad schools. You know, we're committed to sending our kids to bad schools <laughs> uh, and raising them in this sort of neighborhood. I mean, they certainly had better schools than Onesimus had, but that's another story. 
Um, the fact is, I think while they may have been up to four years behind the ATC scoring kind of ways of looking at reality, probably two to ten years ahead in social skills, in ability to incorporate globalism and build cross-cultural relationships. I have to ask myself as a Christian, and my wife too, who's in a doctoral program, it's not that we're anti-education, but really what is important and what is Christian about raising kids today? Is it that they will get into a place like this? Or um, is it that they be faithful to Christ? And, and, and if they are white especially, if your kids cannot internalize their minorityness, because two-thirds of the world, folks, 87% of God's earth is black, brown, and yellow. White is 13%. If you are educating kids Harvard level in a white world, I don't call that education. I call that escape. And that's unreality. The only way your kids can learn to internalize minorityness, I think, is to deal with uh, reality as it is. So therefore, I think you should live in neighborhoods where you are a minority and uh, where your kids can experience that. The city is where that can happen. But again, it's, it's books like this that give me perspective on that, you see, and help me read the New Testament in a way that gives meaning to the people I'm working with. This is a migration, an international migrant story. And it's the heart of the gospel for me. It's clearly Paul, wonderfully Paul. Uh, Paul the evangelist, Paul the discipler, Paul the integrator, Paul the multicultural person. And that's the vision I would hope uh, navigators would have, is to see your discipleship, not in narrow one-on-one -on -one saved lost terms, but in global terms. I hope you'll see yourself in terms of migrant streams and, and gatekeepers and look at all the different... By the way, Paul had a lot more methods than are here. When Paul planted the church in Philippi, he used women to plant it, remember? Uh, Lydia, and of course the, uh, the Philippian jailer was the man in the story of Acts 16, but then two of the three original charter members were women. Uh, the Philippian church, which may have been Paul's successful church, was born out of a women's study group. And there's no hint that men ever took that church over in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, Yodi and Syntyche were the leaders of the church, and they were told by Yoke Fellow, who's clearly a man, that they should, he should help these women get along, not replace them in leadership. Um, very, very interesting, the New Testament use of women. The women in the, in the Jesus story at the beginning of Jesus' life are all failures. The bad news, ladies, of Matthew 1. The women at the end of the life of Jesus are all winners. And all the men in the story are bad. Every single disciple forsakes and flees. And Peter, who's chief, the captain of the crowd, denies publicly Jesus three times under pressure. And the women not only funded those men, money may have been stolen from jo by Joanna, whose husband was treasurer of Herod the Tetrarch. There's some interesting study on that. <laughs> you ever wonder how these disciples went around and just, you know, sponged off Jesus and lived off the land? Well, they had these women who were feeding them money. They paid their way from Galilee down to Jerusalem, and when all the men forsook him and fled, the women were there, and they were there the morning of the tomb and became the first evangelists. Um, so the women at the end of Jesus' life were winners, at the beginning of his life, losers. Jesus' life is bracketed around those women. Fascinating also to read how Paul incorporated women into his ministry. Well, let me just sort of bridge into what we'll talk about this afternoon, which is... Uh, a 2,000 year sweep of the history. No, we're only going to go 1,500 years, or 1,400 probably. A little background of how the world was prepared for the coming of Christ. There's a marvelous line in Galatians 4 4. When the Kairos was fully come, God sent forth his Son. Not Kronos, when the chronology of time was fully come, but the Kairos of time. Kairos is the Greek word for opportune time. Chir chronological time is everyday time. That is, when the stage 
was fully set, God sent forth his son. Now again, viewed historically, how did God do this? Think of how God sent Alexander the Great. 330 years BC, Alexander goes all the way from Western Europe all the way to the Indus River, comes back through the Gulf of Aqaba and dies, having extended the British or the uh, Western rule of the Greeks all the way to the Indus River from the Isle of Britain. Along with that went Hellenism, a philosophy of Greek uh, thought, and language, the trade language I mentioned earlier. That meant you could go anywhere in the world without a visa. Uh, you could go anywhere in the inhabited world at that time, in the Mediterranean world and beyond. Uh, as a Roman citizen, you could travel on Roman roads. So the preparation of the gospel included the Greek contribution. And of course, the Romans came over the Greek Empire and they built roads, set up a law code, and uh, Pax Romana, they had a Roman peace. They, they sort of kept the peace for 100 years. I mean, imagine, if there had been a war on the Parthian front, there wouldn't have been 5,000 people sitting around watching Jesus break the bread in Galilee. They'd all been drafted. It may sound, it may sound funny, but Pentecost wouldn't have had very many people if all those men had been out on the fighting front. The Romans, by organizing the peace for 100 years, Pax Romana, were actually contributing their part to the spreading of the gospel. The Jews, by getting themselves scattered all around the Mediterranean lake, 2,000 mile pond, and building synagogues wherever they went, trans taking their Greek Bible of the Old Testament, literally were setting up Pentecost. When the time was fully come, it's a wonderful text for a Christmas message. When God had used the Greeks, like Alexander, he had used the Romans, he had used the Jews, and now Jesus came. So that this little tiny country at the very tip of the Mediterranean world, far away from Caesar and power in Rome, from the periphery of the edge of the earth comes the gospel. Uh, Darby Nock, former professor of Hellenism at Harvard, made an interesting comment in one of his books. He said from about 300 A.D. to 300 B.C. Um, an interesting phenomenon occurred. Political power and technical power, economic power, was flowing from Europe to Asia. In other words, the Greeks and the Romans were in charge of the world, and they were conquering Asia. Ideas were flowing this way, from Asia to Europe. This went on for 600 years. Christ is in right in the middle. Now, let me ask you the question. Did Christianity come from east or from west? Did it come as part of the power game? Or did it come as an idea, as an ideology, <coughs> along with Mithra and Gnosticism and all those other ideas? It did. Now, it's very interesting to ask the question, who, who won? Did, did the West win or did the East win a 600-year war? The East won. And Europe was conquered by ideas from the East. Now, and Christianity came as one of those ideas on the current of East. As you look at the world today as a missiologist, okay, the last hundred years, political and technical power, again, has been in the West. And we have pushed uh, American British Empire onto the East. 
In the 19th and 20th century, which way has Christianity flowed? From west to east. It's gone from west to east. Now, uh, we're starting to see a reverse flow. Christianity has become so wedded to this, we've almost designed ministry out of the power and technology and the might of America, raising very interesting questions for me about the future and very ominous ones. If, if the West continued to be in charge of the Christian church, I think we'd lose the world because ideas are more powerful than defense budgets in world history, by far. The very fact that in 1900, 90% of all Christians in the world were white and Western. In 1982, let's, let's make it 1980, according to David Barrett, over 52 or 53% of the Christians of the world are now black, brown, and yellow, and south of the equator in the third world. This is what gives me hope, because not only is the New Age movement coming in our day from the East to the West, sort of renaissance Hinduism of sorts, and Gnosticism, New Age is a kind of Gnostic uh, reality. What we're finding is that the Lord, in his providence, I think, has prepared that way, and that the West, which has been repaganizing, will probably find its salvation, not in the West, but by a revitalized Eastern Christian church. I, I can't predict the future, but this is just one more paradigm of history blown up, which m helps me interpret and give me a little hope as I look at the world today. It says, our salvation is not in technical, political, and economic power, in big budgets, and professionalism, and technology, and all that. It's getting back to a form of the faith which the early church understood, and, and that the new evangelists in the West may also be Asians again. Uh, the early church began and spread rapidly. There are about nine reasons given for the rapid spread of the church. I mean, great leaders, Pentecost, the Romans, the Greeks, you know, all of those backgrounds. But very clearly, one reason, and maybe the greatest reason, was the, the average Christian lifestyle. I want to read from one of my favorite early church letters. It's letter to Diognetus. This letter was written about 140 AD, um, figure about 110 years after the cross. Um, I'm going to find this little letter in here. Got lots of letters in here. Um, Again, just like Paul wrote letters, the early Christians wrote letters. This has the Didache, it has Clement's letters, Ignatius' letters, Polycarp's letters. Here's a letter to Diognetus. Now, Diognetus was a government official, and we don't know who wrote this letter, but there's some suspicion a guy named Quadratus may have written it. Chapters 5 and 6 of this letter describe Christians in the world. Let me read to you what this letter says about how Christians lived. For Christians, this is to a government official. By the way, Christians are being persecuted in the early church. We're now 100 years after the cross, all right? And the Christians are trying to explain to the government officials why they shouldn't be persecuted. They're saying, you don't understand. We're the best citizens you've got. You just don't, you've misread us. So here's how he talks. For Christians cannot be distinguished from the rest of the human race by country, language, or customs. They do not live in cities of their own, like Bible Town, Wheaton, 
Pasadena, mm -hmm. etc. They don't live in cities of their own. They, they do not use a peculiar form of speech. They do not follow an eccentric manner of life. This doctrine of theirs has not been discovered by ingenuity or deep thought of inquisitive men, nor do they put forward a merely human teaching, as some people do. Although they live in Greek and barbarian cities alike, that's the only two kind of cities Greeks knew about, were us and them, Greek and barbarian, as each man's lot has been cast, and they follow the customs of the country in clothing and food and other matters of daily living. You see, the early church was living cross-culturally. At the same time, they give proof of the remarkable and admittedly extraordinary constitution of their own commonwealth. I mean, they're living in Chicago, but they're not citizens really of Chicago. They're living in the United States, but they're really not citizens in the this, they belong to another commonwealth. They live, this is a wonderful quote, they live in their own countries, but only as aliens. They have a share in everything as citizens, but they endure everything as foreigners. Every foreign land is their fatherland, and every fatherland is their foreign land. Isn't that wonderful? This is far from Falwell and Ollie Northism and the sort of wrapping the gospel in an American flag and delivering it to the world. This is, this is a, a worldview which some aspects of the evangelical church in this country have forgotten. They marry like everyone else and they begat children, but they do not cast off their offspring. That was Roman birth control, just throw the kid away. They share their board with each other, but not their marriage bed. It is true they live in the flesh, but they do not live according to the flesh. They busy themselves on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. They obey the established laws, but in their own lives they go far beyond what the laws require. They love all men and are by all men persecuted. They are unknown by all condemned. They are put to death, and yet they are brought to life. They're poor, and yet they make many rich. They're completely destitute, and yet they enjoy abundance. They are dishonored, and their very dishonor are glorified. They are defamed and are vindicated. They are reviled, yet they bless. And when they are affronted, they still pay respect. When they do good, they are punished as evildoers. Undergoing punishment, they rejoice because they are brought to life. They are treated like Jews, as foreigners and enemies. They are hunted down by Greeks. And all the time, those who hate them find it impossible to justify their enmity. Now here's chapter 6. To put it simply, what the soul is to the body that Christians are in the world. Okay? Conscience of the world, that's us. The soul is dispersed through all the members of the body, and Christians are scattered through all the cities of the world. You can see why I love this. <laughs> in, in two chapters, three times, cities are mentioned as the na natural in places of habitation of the early church. The soul dwells in the body, but does not belong to the body. The Christians dwell in the world, but do not belong to the world. The soul which is invisible is kept under God and the visible in the same way. Christians are recognized when they're in the world, but their religion remains unseen. They're not doing all kinds of things just to say, oh, what a wonderful group Christians are. It's like the wind. You can only feel the effects. The flesh hates the soul and treats it as an enemy, even though it suffered no wrong because it's prevented from enjoying its pleasures. So too the world hates Christians, even though it suffers no wrong. The soul is shut up in the body, and yet itself holds the body together. Christians are the salt of the city. The soul which is immortal is housed in a mortal dwelling. Christians are settled among corruptible things. The soul, when faring badly as to food and drink, goes better. So too Christians, when punished day by day, increase more and more. Now here is the verse that you should memorize after you've learned John 3.16. It's Diognetus 6.10. The last verse in chapter 6. To no less a post than this hath God ordered them, and they dare not try to evade it. To no less a post than this, that is living this way in the ancient world, to no less a post than this, this is the normal Christian discipleship. And to no less a post than this has God ordained and we dare not try to evade it. Now, I know a lot of people say they want to be like the early church. They really have no idea what they're saying. <laughs> the early church was made up of mostly artisans, freedmen, and slaves. Uh, E.M. Judge, in his book, 
social patterns of first century Christian groups has talked about that. Christians were garbage collectors and they go through the garbage and pick out the bodies and they would wash them and bury them. Even the bubonic plague victims and the burn victims, they would bury them. You know why? Because they were the only people who believed in the resurrection, even of the unjust. Imagine garbage collection strategies for evangelism. The early church provided nursing mothers to sit under the statues of Zeus in the plazas of, um, of, of Egypt. Some research I did showed that um, one, one of the most interesting evangelism strategies was baby hunts. The women would organize the office of deacon, women deacon in Alexandria in the second century. They would organize baby hunts. They would actually go out and pick up the babies that had been tossed out during the night and bring them back to the nursing mothers, the wet nurses who would be sitting under the play piazzas, uh, under the statues of Zeus. And it's a deacon's activity to provide these nursing mothers in public squares. This is what deacons did. They didn't just hand out communion cups in the sanctuaries. I mean, they were out there providing nursing mothers so children could be brought there to be nursed and they catechized and baptized them. And that's how the church grew. Are you really sure you want to be like the early church? E.M., uh, or rather, um, the um, Stanford urbanologist, Mumford, who's written about 28 books on cities, has a wonderful line in one of his books. He, he describes the pattern of early Christians in the third century. And he says, they used to go, door to door in the tenements. Hello, are there any sick people here? And they would move in, offer to move in and nurse them until they got well. They literally went after the sick and offered to move in. And, and here's what Mumford said, instead of min ministering out of images of success, early Christians looked for <coughs> misery human misery and transformed it into occasions of fellowship and love. That's powerful. Imagine going to look for the sick, deliberately exposing yourself to their illnesses to share the love of Jesus. Tertullian, writing about the year 200 in his 37th and 51st Apologies, flaunts the emperor. He taunts him. He says, we, meaning Christians, here's a layman now, the guy who invented the word Trinity. He says, we, meaning Christians, have filled up every place belonging to you, meaning pagans. Islands, castles, caves, market, senate, prison, palace, forum, we leave you your temples only. I mean, Christians, by the year 200, had literally penetrated every level of society. That was how evangelism was done. I, um, Kenneth Strand, a Scottish scholar, um, some years ago, wrote an essay on the nine reasons why the church spread. And he concluded, and I agreed with him, that th the power of the early church was not their preaching. They never did rent the Colosseum and have a Billy Graham crusade. They never did. They never did mass meetings. They weren't allowed. They never did media. It was lay people, basically, and it was the, the power, the attraction of the Christian was their superior ethics, their superiority in their morals and ethics, the way they handled their families, the way they lived together and loved the poor and the sick. That led people to want to come to Jesus. And I'm convinced that um, that's a piece of evangelism that we must recover if we're going to win the country. I, I can't tell one whit of difference between Christians and non-Christians in this culture anymore. Hardly any difference. Same number of pregnancies among unwed mothers, same drug problems, same family divorce issues, almost indistinguishable. The rich are moving away from the poor if they're Christians almost faster than, than the uh, non-Christians are moving away from the poor. Um, I think um, 
reflections on this history uh, give me some clues as to the way out. The question is, will we pay the price? Will we pay the price? Well, it is time to go, and uh, we need to come back about 1.30. What we'll be doing the next couple sessions is basically a, a trip through the centuries, reflection on pieces of church history until the Reformation. See you about 1.30.